I'm recording to the cloud. Okay. Thank okay. You. Yep. So we should be good. All right. Now we're good. <laughs> and hopefully everybody can see that. And so it's kind of appropriate tonight that I'm talking about spotted lantern fly to a, a butterfly club because most of the time the first people see the adult, which you're looking here at, and I'll show you another picture of it. They think this is actually a moth or a butterfly because of its coloration. And it is, as an adult, it's a very colorful insect. So I think that's kind of neat tonight. So what I'm gonna to try to do today is talk a little bit about spotted lanternfly, where it came from, uh, why we're concerned about it, um, how far has it just, um, moved um, in the last couple of years. And hopefully this will generate some questions. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about management. So I'm gonna start with this video. And this was taken by a student, a graduate student at Penn State. And what this is, is a tree that is absolutely covered with adult lantern flies. And this would be in October of um, the year uh, when they congregate on structures like this. And so this, this is just kind of to prepare you for what I'm going to be talking about. And so this is the adult, that's the picture I mentioned. And as you can see, it is very, very colorful, but it is not a butterfly or moth, as I'm sure you're aware. It's a plant hopper in the, the it's a full gourd, and it's an, an invasive plant hopper that was introduced from Northern China. It is Asian in nature. Um, however, in South Korea, Taipan, Taiwan, Vietnam, and Japan, it is an invasive insect, just like it has become here in the United States. And one of the problems, and, and we tend to see this a lot, uh, we saw it with brown marmorated stink bug, and we've seen it with a couple of others of these invasive insects that have come in in the last 20 years. It has a very wide host range uh, here in the US, um, actually probably wider than it actually has over in Europe. And it has a preference for feeding on plants with high sugars. Now, I also want to point out here, and if you can see my cursor, this picture here, this is a native full gourd. So we do have them here in um, New Jersey. Um, this is also very colorful, but this is minuscule in terms of comparison to the adult spotted lantern fly. They're about an inch and a half or so long. And so they're a fairly good sized um, bug as a um, as an adult. And I've also got another picture here. Um, this is also a, a lantern fly. This one's another one from Asia. And so as a group, they're all very colorful. This is just a map of Asia pointing out the areas, uh, again, uh, native to China and invasive in, in Japan, um, Korea, and Taiwan. So here in the United States, um, once it got introduced, um, one of the first things that the USDA did was to create a map, and they do this for every invasive organism that comes into the country that they think might become a problem. And basically, it's, it's a modeling procedure that gives them um, a potential area for infestation. And as you can see here, the red areas are the high areas. And New Jersey is, is definitely red. And so we do have a high potential for it to, to establish here. And indeed it has the last couple of years. So the initial find was in 2014 um, in Berks County, Pennsylvania. And it was at a landscaping yard where they had a shipment of stone that came in from Asia and they didn't realize that it had egg masses on it and those egg masses hatched and they started to find these little insects running around that they'd never seen before and then in the fall when they became adults they knew that they had a big problem um, because there were just hundreds and hundreds of these adults on their property. Since then it has uh, spread to several other counties in Pennsylvania. 
and that this map is is a little dated um it is also now uh, been found out in the pittsburgh area and then right across the line in ohio as well so here in new jersey um our first um indication that we might have it in here in New Jersey came from Warren County. Uh, fortunately, it happened in December and it was actually a uh, Christmas tree that had been cut down in Pennsylvania that had the, the spotted lantern fly on it and brought it in. So it was contained and we thought we didn't have a problem. Um, however, uh, very quickly after that, we started having problems in uh, Mercer County as well and so the state set up a quarantine um, of three counties uh, warren county uh, mercer county and hunterdon because hunterdon was in between those two uh, to try and prevent um, the spread of um, that insect out of those counties and i'll talk a little bit in a while what that means in terms of quarantine and then in 2019 uh, we also uh, found established populations in Somerset, Burlington, Camden, and Salem. And this year, um, the populations, the sightings um, and, and establishments have just completely exploded. And I'll show you a map of that as, as well in a second. So it's not just a Pennsylvania, uh, New Jersey issue. Um, it is also an issue in Delaware, it's an issue in Maryland and Northern Virginia and uh, West Virginia in their fruit growing regions. Um, it is now present in New York State and it has, they've found a population of it in Connecticut and so it is spreading um, out throughout the East. And so as I mentioned, um, initially the Department of Agriculture um, established a three county quarantine in 2018, uh, 2019, that was expanded um, to additional counties. And part of the way that they're finding that these insects um, is through this email that we have. Um, we set this up actually in anticipation that it might get here a couple of years before it actually did. And it gives people a way to tell us uh, that they're finding it. And on the website where, where you click this um, address, um, it asks people to send us a picture and we need, we'd like to either have GPS coordinates or the um, local area and, and address so we can pinpoint and it initially uh, give that information to the Department of Agriculture uh, so that they can go to that location and confirm that it, whether it's established or not. Now they are not doing that anymore because this is now spread so wide. Um, they are not really responding to those kinds of things, but we still are taking this information because we have things that we can do with it to help us uh, with solving this problem. Right now, the Department of Agriculture is um, pretty much um, concentrating on finding new established populations that are in the vicinity of wine um, vineyards. And so, um, and again, I'll talk about that in a second, but that's, that's primarily what they are now doing. And so here at Rutgers, we also have people that are working on research and, and, and monitoring programs. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of that as well. And so the, just to show you what we get with these reports, um, this is 2018 and we had 45 reports. Again, um, that was when we first really started trying to get the word out. So we, it was slow. I'm sure there's more locations than what we had. And fortunately, 75% um, of them um, were positive because people gave us a picture. When they don't give us a picture, we have to email them back and, and it, it's a longer process. And you can see that as they went through their development that we'll talk about, um, our first report started coming in in July and they increased um, through August and into September. And so this is just the number of reports that we saw between 2018 and 2019. And you can see that we had a very large jump in the number of reports 
This is partly probably because of better advertising uh, on our part and also the Department of Ag um, and also th that it was spreading. And so for the whole year, we got 252 and now because people know what to do, we're, we're up to 97% in terms of positive reports because of those pictures. So this is just a breakout of where all of those reports were coming from in 2018 and 2019. And Hunterdon County was the number one county where all the um, reports were coming from. And that is kind of an indication that they were spreading pretty quickly through Hunterton and actually they were. Uh, this is just um, time of year for reports. Um, what this tells us is there's usually two periods during the year that people um, start seeing this and, and this is uh, when they're juveniles, um, they can be in very large numbers and, and they are colorful. And then later in the year when people start seeing the adults, which is the most concerning um, because that's the mobile stage and they do fly and that's one of the main ways that they get, or get around. Okay, here's those maps. Um, this just gives you an indication in terms of the number of reports uh, from 2018 to 2020. And it's obvious here that we had an explosion of reports in 2020. And I have a sneaking suspicion that that's probably due to the fact that this insect is spreading out throughout the state. So again, um, it's a colorful insect. Um, they are pretty large, uh, an inch to an inch and a half in a size as adults. And they have these, the coloration. And so this is just pointing out that the hemielytra um, on this insect um, is grayish with black spots and underneath they have red and black spots on the hind wings and yellow and black markings on the dorsal part of the abdomen. Life cycles, um, what you're looking at here is an egg mass. They are whitish in color when they're first laid and then they turn this color and right next to it, to the upper left, you can actually see an egg mass from the year before and you can see the emergence holes of, of the uh, first instars coming out of that egg mass. Um, they start laying the eggs in August and November. Um, they will have 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. And this is the overwintering stage um, for the insect. Um, they hatch in, in Virginia in, in May and in Pennsylvania also in May. And that's when they hatch here in New Jersey as well. And the hatch rates are somewhere between 60 to 90% uh, depending on temperatures. They like cool temperatures, although there is a lower limit as to what they can survive. So they have four instars. Um, the first instars are black with uh, white spots and then eventually they develop the red coloration uh, with white spots. The nymphs are very mobile. Um, people at uh, in West Virginia have looked at this and they can actually move um, three and a quarter feet per minute. And they can, are also very good jumpers. They could jump 16 feet in 15 minutes. So they can move around fairly quickly. Um, there is a connection with Tree of Heaven uh, with this insect. And initially we thought that it had to feed on uh, Tree of Heaven in order to complete its life cycle. Um, the data today is indicating that might not be the case. Um, so after four instars, um, it does mature to the adult, as you can see. And the fortunate thing is that this only has one generation per year. So this is just a graphic um, starting with the egg masses and going um, clockwise around the circle here. Um, the first instars are hatching in May to June. Second instars are showing up in June and July. Thirds in June and July as well. And then the fourth instars anytime from July to September. 
and then July to December, we actually see emergence of the adults and then they start laying their eggs um, in September and we'll continue to lay eggs um, through December as long as we don't have the cold temperatures like what we've been having the last couple of weeks. And so this is just a picture of the nymphs on um, plant material. So they don't have a diapause, uh, but I mentioned there is a temperature. Um, it eight degrees is the critical th threshold um, for egg hatch, and they have need that so they can go through the degree days um, for cooling um, in order to hatch. So we are working here at Rutgers. One of my colleagues is working on a degree day model so we can use temperature to try and key in on certain um, events during their life cycle. I also have a graduate student that is doing some of the temperature work that goes into this. Um, and right now he is sequestered up in uh, Connecticut at the Forest Service Quarantine Lab because we, we don't have a laboratory here in New Jersey that um, APHIS will actually allow us to rear the insect to do the work. So he's going to be spending the semester up in Connecticut at this facility. He's basically in quarantine shutdown because of COVID. So he only leaves on the weekends. Um, the egg masses themselves, um, the, on small trees, the egg masses are below three meters, um, but they can get very high in the trees as well. And here in New Jersey, where we're most interested or concerned is vineyards. And I'll say this a couple of times, that's really the only place where we've seen any economic damage for agriculture. And they also like uh, wild grape as well. So I'm not gonna go through this whole list, but you can see it does have a wide host range. There are some things in here that are very common, uh, things like sugar maple and red maple, black lo locust, dogwoods, um, walnut is a host, and there are several other things as well. So these are the ones that we tell people to think about. Um, preferred hosts are on the list on the left. And so things like tree of heaven, grape, black walnut, the birches, and the maples and, and willow um, are preferred hosts. Now they do get on conifers, but we have no, nothing that suggests that they will actually feed on conifers. Um, there are only certain trees that so far we know they can complete development on, and that's tree of heaven, black walnut, china berry, tulip tree, sawtoothed oak, hops, oriental bittersweet, and butternut. And some of these trees are, act, are as you probably know, very common in the forest landscape. And so if you've never seen a tree of heaven, this is what it looks like, although I can't believe you haven't. Um, it, there are male and female trees. The females get these yellow inflorescence um, early in the summer um, that turn this reddish yellow color um, as they mature. And eventually they will dry down to um, dark seed pods that drop off the tree and enter into the seed bank to start new trees. Um, this is just a way to tell uh, tree heaven from things like sassafras. Um, you look at the tip, the bottom of, of the leaves and it has this little, I'll call it, they call them teeth, but this little area right in here. And that's how you tell the difference. So walnut, um, again, it is one of the preferred hosts and, and in the fall, uh, one of the places I go looking for are walnut trees. I can usually find them very easily. Um, I've not had much success um, finding them on dogwood trees, although they are reported uh, by the Penn State people uh, to be a preferred host. Uh, I have seen them on sugar maple. And again, um, this is a concern. Um, we're not sure how far north this insect might be able to spread but the people in Vermont are already concerned about that and that's because of maple um, syrup production and they're concerned and they get concerned whenever there's an insect that likes sugar maple that's coming their way. We have some uh, recommended non-chemical uh, management tactics 
um, starting with scraping the egg masses off the trees if you can find them. Um, you need to start looking between October and you can do this until through May. And as you scrape them off, and actually the Department of Ag was distributing what looked like credit cards. They were um, cards to help you ID the insect and the egg mass and you scrape them off and into a plastic bag and, and dispose of them after double bagging them or placing the eggs in alcohol or hand sanitizer. The, the, um, the alcohol in both will, will kill the eggs. Uh, another non-chemical management tactic is tree banding. And so this is very similar to what we used to do back in the 70s um, for gypsy moth control. So if you remember those sticky bands that people were asked to put around the, the oak trees in, in high infestation areas, it's the same idea. It's sticky as they land on it or walk on it, um, they get stuck to it. So these chemical, non-chemical tactics do have some issues. Uh, one with the egg masses, having tried to do this myself, they are very, very difficult to find, partly because of the coloration and partly because they like to lay their eggs on the undersides of things like um, branches or trees that have fallen over and have a, an under area that they can lay their eggs on. And so you really have to get down and dirty sometimes to find these things, uh, but they are out there. In terms of the tree banding, um, we have issues with the tree banding now that we're, we're starting to not really talk a lot about this uh, because of what's called bycatch. And that basically means that these things actually will also catch things that we don't want to be killed. Uh, including things like monarch butterflies, um, um, lizards, and toads, and other types of small organisms. They've also shown at Penn State that if you don't remove these things um, frequently, they get so many of the adults in the fall on these traps that other adults are able to just walk over the top of them and get to the other, get a, above the band without getting stuck. And so they're non-chemical, but they do have some issues. So we kind of go with the Department of Ag in Pennsylvania's um, program for management. Um, it targets tree of heaven. Um, and the idea is if you have tree in heaven on the property, uh, you kill 90% of the trees and trying to um, target the males, or I'm sorry, the female trees so that they don't put any more seeds into the seed bank. Um, and then applying this herbicide to the, to the stump that's left over, because if you don't, they will um, refoliate. And then the idea here initially was that, that in May, you would treat the remaining trees um, with um, dinotefuran, which is a neonicotinoid. It's a systemic and gets um, moved throughout the whole tree, although that has issues as well, as you know, I'm sure, with pollinators. Um, they have now adjusted this, and, and we have to, um, to say that don't treat the trees unless you actually find the lantern flies on the tree. Um, and, and that has to do with the pollinators. Now there's also um, some discussion now in the research community about this in terms of how effective cutting down tree of heaven is actually going to be. So again, this is the current recommendation um, if you have tree of heaven, but that may change. So for the non-tree of heavens, the first thing I'm, I'm going to say, if it's not there, don't spray your tree. You're going to waste insecticide and you could potentially create other issues because many of those materials listed here on the uh, right-hand side of, of this um, slide, um, the contact insecticides and the systemics, they are all toxic to pollinators. Now we do have some natural products, uh, neem oil and Bulvaria bassiana, which is a fungus that is commercially available as a, that can be sprayed that you can treat trees with it. And if they're there, it will kill them. 
Um, but you know, we really don't want people doing this unless they've actually seen the spotted lantern flies on their plant material. So what is the risk here? Uh, well, there's some things going on in the landscape. Um, when you have high populations of these insects, uh, these insects are like aphids. They excrete honeydew because they are fluid feeders and they pass a lot of fluid through their bodies. They have to get rid of it. And if you've ever had problems with aphids or even lace bugs on oak trees, which also create honeydew, uh, when they excrete it, it gets on the plant material, it gets on the cars and other things, and it gets sticky. Um, and in that sticky material, a fungus called sooty mold grows, and that causes another problem. And so the issue here is with the, the landscape, um, understory plants, and we see this in the forest as well, um, because of all the sooty mold, they, they die because they can't photosynthesize. So the forest is the reservoir for the egg masses. Um, they will lay them in the, in the border areas um, around things like um, vineyards and properties and so forth, and then they move in after they hatch. Um, in terms of agriculture, as I've already said, uh, wine grapes is the issue. And as you can see in that picture, the, the, it, uh, the adults, when they move into the, the, the grapes late in the season, um, sooty mold can develop on that as well. And so that's an issue. Um, there's so many of them in the droops um, that when they pick them and take them to crush, they're concerned about adults getting in and being crushed and tainting. And there's also an issue here over in Pennsylvania where a couple of orchards, or I'm sorry, vineyards have actually been um, killed because of all the feeding um, by so many of the adults when they move in. We think there may be an issue with tree fruit, but that, that really hasn't happened as yet. So Jen, do I see you, are we halfway through? Yeah, uh, okay. just a, a little bit under, but yeah. Okay, so does anybody have a question? I'll let you moderate that, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, actually, Dr. Each, um, I'm not sure if you noticed. Um, so I think, and I'm not sure, I don't think I'm the only one. Uh, I know Donna and I think Gary see it. A uh, part of your screen, it looks like it maybe froze when you were giving the presentation. So actually, if you could just escape and then start the presentation, like open it back up into presentation mode. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, okay. a part of it just froze at the top, just a very little bit. Oh, no, it's still there. Um, Joe has a question. Yeah, I, I'm a, sure. uh, yeah about that uh, eight degrees Celsius, is, is that an upper limit or a lower limit? Lower limit. They have to, so that for the for the eggs, they have to have that temperature to be able to get a good hatch rate. But if they go, if the temperature, um, the lower temperature is actually closer to zero. Yeah, well, that, that makes a little more sense because you know that you're way up in the forties there. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, many species of. Uh, plant hoppers are attracted to lights at night. Is the spotted lantern fly attracted to lights at night? You know, I honestly don't know. I no one's know, been able to answer that question. No, nobody has talked about it. Let me put it that way. Um, if you, if you and that's, that, that's, that is surprising uh, because many of the people that are working on this insect were the ones that worked on black uh, brown marmorated stink bug and, and we knew almost immediately that they were attracted to, to lights because we would find thousands of them at, at lights at night. That hasn't been talked about in the community. So I, it doesn't mean they don't, but nobody's noticed that yet. I've had, um, I've had dozens of uh, plant hoppers uh, come to my moth lights at night. Dozens yeah. of species. I, I would I would expect that yeah I, I've seen that when I've done black lighting at night as well. Wade, Paula says she's had them at night. I talked. Okay, at least four or five of them. Okay. 
Um, so in the chat, Gary would like to know, are there any biocontrols being investigated, predators or pure Oh, I'm getting there. Yes, <laughs> there are. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, are there any further questions? Uh, yeah, this is Lee. I have uh, just a follow up for Joe, because this is something new to me, this eight degrees uh, centigrade critical threshold, and then you had 550 DD. Can you explain Degree to days. You all this Sure, means? I, I absolutely can. Um, to, it, because insects developed um, at different rates, depending on temperature, uh, we have a way of determining um, what their lower development threshold is, and then we can use weather data, uh, minimum and maximum temperatures yeah, on a daily eight, basis eight, 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 to calculate those yeah, degree days. Degrees. That's 40 degrees. Right. No. And so the- It has the, to be colder than that. And then the calculation is actually to take, oh. uh, for a day, take the maximum and minimum temperature um, add them together and, and divide by two to get an average. And then th that number, you subtract the uh, lower development threshold. And usually with insects, it's around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then um, we do that on a daily basis and we can accumulate them over a period of time. And from the temperature work that we do with, in incubators at how many, how long it takes at one temperature to develop, uh, we can determine that, say, they need to go through 150 degree days in the first instar before they molt to the second. And you can follow that through the season and then make predictions based on degree days when certain things can happen. Oh. And you can do this for any insect. Um, you can do this for Lepidoptera. It's been developed for things like tobacco hornworm, corn earworm, European corn borer, um, and several other pest lepidopteran species. So this is what I was doing in high school when we were doing the fruit flies and we didn't want them to breed. So we, <laughs> we would put them in the refrigerator. Right, That's right. <laughs> yes, uh, that cold temperature slowed their development down, I'm right. sure. Okay, thank you. you. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I think you're good, Dr. H. Okay. Uh, everyone, please just mute your microphones, okay? So, Jen, let me know when we're getting close to 45 minutes. Okay. Because I know oh. that's when you want me to stop so we have time for more questions. Uh, oh. Well, we, I think we could go to the end, but yeah, but I'll let okay. you know when we're okay. getting close. Yeah, keep me on time. All right, so again, um, here is an adult and you can see the darkened areas here. That is sooty mold that's developing on um, the um, honeydew that they have um, produced. Uh, this is just a picture of sooty mold on some of the understory plants. This really doesn't do the problem justice. Um, I've seen them where they are completely black because of the sooty mold. Here's a dead vineyard. This is one of the vineyards in Pennsylvania that they had so many adults in, at, in the fall that they, after the, the vines senesced, um, they didn't refoliate in the spring and they're attributing that to the amount of fluid that they took out of the, out of the vines um, when the adults were in there feeding. And so uh, again, here's just, you can see honeydew on the leaf and that's an adult again feeding. All right, and I said that earlier, so we'll go on. Um, so some of the phenology studies, basically looking at what this insect is doing at different times of the year, um, they do see the first and second instars in the vineyards in, in early June, and the fourth instars in, in later in July. Um, and adults in August. And that is on wild grapes. And they don't see them going to the cultivated grapes until late September. And so the, the chart at the bottom is just blocking out um, where they are at at different times of the year um, based on host plant. 
So surveillance, of course, is something that we need to um, figure out what they're doing, where they're moving, how large are the densities. Um, if they're an economic problem, we need that information so we can plan different kinds of, of control or management strategies and, and when best to do that. And, and so we are in a, a surveillance program um, trying to slow the spread of this. And one of the ways we can do that is with an early detection uh, followed by a rapid response program. Um, and so we, there's a lot of coordination that has to go on with this. And they do this kind of thing in New Zealand uh, when they get an invasive and they um, sit, calculate that, you know, a 1% increase in detection would save um, several million dollars. And uh, so we need a reliable monitoring tool. And as of yet, we, we really don't have um, any perfect monitoring tool. But one thing that has been worked on is with the use of eDNA. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it was originally developed um, for use in aquatic environments. So in, instead of being um, going to a stream and taking electrodes and electrode zapping the fish in the stream to do a census, um, if you have know the DNA of, of a species, they can actually take water. And that's what this diagram is actually showing. They, they take the water and they filter it through a filter system and the filter picks up the DNA and then they go and they do a DNA analysis. And if they find the DNA, that's an indication that that fish is in that stream. And so uh, Julie Lockwood's lab at, in our ecology evolution department at Rutgers has been working on this for terrestrial systems. She and her students um, did um, develop one that works very well for brown marmorated stink bug. And now her group has developed one um, for the spotted lantern fly. And it, it, it works pretty well. Um, and we can go to places where we can't see the insect, but if we find honeydew, uh, we collect the honeydew. And they do that by washing the, the plant material and collecting it and it picks up the honeydew and DNA that's in that. And then they um, filter it and take it back to the lab. And so this is just a picture of the crew and you can see them washing the plant material and collecting that material. And then at the far right, that, that is a wet roller similar to what you paint with that they are running across the, the foliage uh, that's got honeydew on it. And so, as I said, this has been very effective. Um, it won't tell you anything about density, but it will give you an early detection system. And so here in New Jersey with the system, we actually you were able to detect a population at a park um, up north of um, Clinton, no, not Clinton, um, over in the Phillipsburg area. Um, early in the summer in 2018, um, before there were any other, any populations known in the area. And then very shortly after that, uh, people started finding the adults. So it, it does work very, very well. And so this is just where some of the locations that they've been working with this. These are all vineyards um, here in New Jersey. And they go out and they sample vines and wash them, collect the water, uh, take them back and, and do the, the genetic analysis. And um, if you're interested in that, the, the, the analysis of the hot shot extraction and amplification with TACMAN qPCR, please do not ask me anything about that. I'm, I'm not the geneticist. I don't work with DNA. So I probably can't answer your question. Um, here's in a vineyard. Um, where they're doing exactly the same thing. This time they are not only spraying the foliage, um, they are spraying the clusters or the droops as well and collecting that. And so they are also in this work um, comparing it to visual 
uh, counts. And this is basically walking around the plants um, for a specified period of time and counting all the individuals. And you can see here that the eDNA was actually able to detect them um, when they couldn't find any individuals at all on the plant material. And they did that in one farm in Atlanta County, one in hundred and uh, actually three in hundred and, and, and four in, um, in Warren. And that was in September. And here's the data when they went back and did it again in October. And same kind of results, except for that one farm in Hunterdon and the one farm in uh, Warren County. And so this does tell us that it's a little variable and they're, they're still trying to refine that. I'm gonna skip this one. This is probabilities, but it does show that there's a higher probability of finding it over visual um, observations. Um, and, and it's much greater probability that it's gonna detect it. And I'm gonna skip that as well. So let's talk a little bit about management of the insect. Um, that starts with quarantining. Uh, and so that basically means the, the state quarantines the three counties initially. And then there are things that people need to do before they move out of that county um, and moving like things like cars, uh, lumber, um, even toys, um, because they will lay eggs on all these things. And they are also very good hitchhikers. And so containment is basically a self-inspection. For commercial people, there are actually, there's actually training that they have to go through and they get a certificate, it's online training, that they have to keep in their vehicles. And then they have to keep a log of when they've done their um, self-inspections and keep, keep copies of that as well. Um, physical controls, um, egg scraping, I've already talked about that. There is some work going on um, with exclusion netting. And it's basically using nets uh, to cover the, the, the vineyards um, with a mesh size that they can't get through. Uh, biological control, um, there are people that are looking at exotic natural enemies to, to hopefully um, be released for the, their control. And um, th there are other groups that are looking at endemic uh, natural enemies as um, here as well. And basically, we have natural enemies. Do any of them attack this? And then there's also work going on with conventional. And because we do have um, organic wine growers um, in Pennsylvania and in New Jersey, um, there's always this question about whether it's or OMRI certified. And that is an organization that certifies different materials um, and other things other than the use of pesticides. Um, if they okay it, then the organic grower is allowed to use that um, on their plant material. And so again, this is what those eggs look like. Um, they are very, very hard to find. And so this is probably going to help, but in a commercial ag situation, it's probably not gonna solve the problem. And so, Here's a little bit of information about them looking at um, parasitoids um, for um, spotted lanternfly eggs um, in um, China. And they have identified two species, Anastatus orientalis and Dryinus species uh, that are, are near brawny. Um, and they are both currently in US APHIS quarantine facilities I believe the facility is the one that is in Newark, Delaware, and they are being screened. Um, they are trying to, first thing they do is rear these through one generation to make sure that they don't bring in what we call hyperparasites. These are parasites of the parasites, and they tend to have broader host ranges than the parasites that we want to. So they do that. And what they're doing now is they are looking at the potential for these organisms to attack other types of insect eggs. 
Um, and that, that the concern is that we don't want to release something that's going to have an impact on our native insects here. And we initially don't know what they will go after. And so they, they test a lot of different things. You know, once they get through that, um, then they can apply for a, a permit with APHIS. And if it's approved, then they can start uh, mass rearing it and uh, making um, releases in various areas. Now, there are some natural enemies out there that will eat spotted lanternfly, and we see praying mantises here. And the one on the left, that's a wheel bug that's feeding on an adult, and then we have a spider feeding on um, juveniles. Um, there, so that means that there are things out there. Unfortunately, these, these are not um, organisms that we tend to think of in terms of biocontrol. Um, because one, they don't um, exist in high numbers and they are generalist feeders, which means they feed on a lot of different things. So they don't cue in on just one thing at a time, which is what we need for the, the uh, natural enemy to be effective at managing the uh, pest or invasive insect population. Uh, they have found a, a parasitoid here in the U.S. that will attack those the, those eggs. It's not reported to attack spotted lanternfly in China, but what it is, it's actually, and that's the picture of it um, in the upper right, um, is a parasitoid that was introduced for gypsy moth control back in 1908. And so it's been out in our forest for a very long time and, and they have found it emerging out of the egg masses at about a rate of 7%. And when it does attack, it, uh, it, it's attacking 20% of the eggs in that, um, in that egg mass. And unfortunately it's not found everywhere. It's only found in certain locations. So there are insecticides that can be used and this is, Right now, primarily what uh, vineyardists are doing for management, and this is very typical for an invasive species. We saw this with brown marmorated stink bug, and, and now after 20 years, we, we've gotten away from just spraying pesticides, which is good, and hopefully we'll do this for this insect. Hopefully it won't take 20 years like it did with the stink bug. And so, um, Penn State is leading this and they are evaluating all kinds of different materials against the nymphs. And so these are different classes of insecticides. And the thing that is important here is days of activity and that evaluation in that final column on the right, how good is the control? And so we have things that are excellent and good at controlling these. Um, and the last one, the one on the bottom of the list is Bulvaria bassiana. It is good at killing the nymphs. And so this is what a nymph infected with that material looks like. Um, it gets this white cottony um, um, looking um, texture to it on the outside. And, and that's basically the fungi that's coming out and releasing um, its spores. And so the, there are commercial products out there um, that can be used. And these are actually things that a homeowner should be able to buy if they have problems with, uh, if they're growing grapes on their property um, to treat for this. And so the nymphs are not really known to injure the grapevines. So they're not recommending um, that they make any additional um, applications, which is good because we don't want them to use any more than they have to. They do have to do um, applications for grape berry moth and sometimes for Japanese beetle. And the materials they use for that um, does a very good job of controlling the nymphs. So the bigger problem is the invasion of the, the adults um, late in the season, just as the grapes are starting to, um, to ripen. And so they will come into the vineyards as the tree of heaven um, trees are, are in decline. 
And so there's a big association with vineyard borders. And so people are trying to cut down um, Tree of Heaven in the borders around their, their vineyards to try and control this. Uh, they feed mostly on the cordons and the trunks. Again, they're not feeding directly on the fruit. And um, depending on the variety and when it's harvested, um, there is management that's needed both pre-harvest and post-harvest. And so again, Penn State's done the same thing that they did with the nymphs. They looked at all the materials to see how good they were against the adults. And the first thing you can see here, if you just look at that final right-hand column, there are less things that are effective against the um, adults. And so all the materials that we have here that are good are, um, they're not things that you can use in an organic vineyard. They're all synthetic materials. And if you look at these, uh, again, as I said earlier, uh, these are all things that are very bad on pollinators. However, at that time of the year, there shouldn't be any pollinators in, in the vineyard. So um, we get a break with that. And this is just kind of for this year, um, it was suggesting that the risk with the eDNA work was going to be higher than it was in 2019. And so control the nymphs with these two products um, that you're already applying. Um, look for the adults along the edges of the borders. And then instead of spraying, if the vineyard is a large one, instead of spraying the whole vineyard, just spray the borders. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, uh, because that's where the adults are going to tend to be congregating as they come in. And so that means that we are sp spraying a lot less um, in terms of an insecticide, excuse me. And we have several materials that they could do that with. And so I'm at near the end here today. Um, this is, I think, of my last slide. And so what is key? Well, learn how to identify this bug um, so that if you see it, uh, you can report it if you want to, or you can take your own action on your own property. Um, good news is it only has one generation per year. Um, eDNA did suggest a higher risk in 2020, um, which did happen. And I'm sure that the risk is going to be even higher uh, in 2021 as we move into the spring in that we're really only concerned with this insect in terms of agriculture with grapes and landscape ornamentals. However, for the private citizen, there are there is the issue of these adults uh, uh, and the, the nymphs getting to large population sizes and excreting all that honeydew and that's gonna create a big problem. And the adults are gonna be a nuisance if there's thousands of them on the property flying around just like the stink bugs did. Okay, so uh, that's my last slide. I am going to hand it back over to you, Jen. I'm gonna stop sharing. And if anybody has any more questions, I'd be more than happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Dr. H. Um, so we have one question right now in the chat and that is from Bob and Kathy Wilson. And they wanted to know, what is the impact of forest trees and understory? It probably won't impact the trees themselves, but the understory under the trees, if there's large populations excreting large amounts of honeydew, uh, they get on those understory plants, they're going to get the sooty mold, and that's going to cause them to decline over multiple years because they, they're not able to photosynthesize like they should. And they have, they have seen some dieback over in Pennsylvania in the early infested areas where this is happening. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, this is Lee. I have a question regarding the honeydew. We know that um, in established ecosystems, for instance, ants will help to tend those insects that make the honeydew. 
does that help to control the development of that mold? And is there something that's feeding off of the lantern flies yet? I don't know of any ant tending going on with the lantern flies. Um, that's not in the literature, so I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm not sure whether or not the ants with aphids are able to um, remove and collect enough of the honeydew so that there isn't actually any deposited that could have the, the um, sooty mold on it. But my, my thought would be that, you know, if you have a large population of aphids, they probably are not collecting all of the honeydew to take back to their nests. Yeah. And so there's that possibility. The one thing that they do do that is well established is those ants will actually defend those aphids. They would keep them, they keep predators and, and parasitoids away from them so they don't lose their food source. If they did the same thing with um, spotted lantern fly, it would probably be with the juveniles. And that could be a problem in terms of having any kind of biological control. Uh, one other thing, um, uh, no, you can't do this in the agricultural section, but if you find them on your own property and you're trying to save trees, do you think you could uh, spray with alcohol on those egg masses, uh, soak them? Do you think that would be effective? Um, you know, okay. I don't, nobody's looked at that, but... I would think that, and I would only do this after the tree has defoliated, and I would only do it on the egg masses, um, probably a simple solution of 1% soap and water would have the same effect, and that would be probably um, a little more environmentally friendly, because mm -hmm. I, I know that um, the insecticidal soaps do work. Okay, thank you. Yep. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't have a question. I have a comment. Um, my daughter lives in Philadelphia and I was visiting her last summer and uh, all of a sudden one of these adult lanternflies um, flew by us. And um, it's rather scary the amount that they had because you know, as, you know, as a, we walked around the rest of the day, um, you were constantly running into them. Um, they have done an excellent job of making their citizens aware of the problem because, you know, I had never seen one before and she's the one when she saw it going by, she's like, kill it, kill it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, for yeah. the first time they had yeah. huge problems in Philadelphia this year. Yeah, they, yeah. they did. And it was, if you walked around, you would just constantly see them. And then, you know, you would see, and for my daughter, a 24 year old who doesn't follow any of this to know what it was and that she would <laughs> kill it, you know, I thought that was pretty impressive. And you, and you know, as you walked around, you saw people all over the place. It looked like everybody was dancing on the street as they step on them. Yep. Um, and they're rather they're very they're rather very slow so once you see one you could just step on it it, it they weren't you know they're very slow mm -hmm. um does anyone else have any questions or anything to add yeah, they're I'll also just... they're also in manhattan in central park that does not surprise me mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I, they are, they were, they were in Staten Island. I didn't know that they had gotten into Central Park, but they did get into Staten Island this year, and they also got uh, into Connecticut this year as well. So, um, before I go, if there aren't any other questions, I do have something else I just want to bring up, since you're insect enthusiasts. Um, are you all aware that we are going to have a major brood of the 17-year cicadas this year in New Jersey and all up and down the eastern seaboard as far south as Virginia? I if, am. You're, if, you're, if you're not, or if you've never seen the emergence, it's, it's a miraculous thing to go see. And the, the noise is deafening. And so one of the best locations last time when they were out was in Princeton. 
And yep. so th those of you that are, if you're in the Princeton area, if you go to Battleground State Park, um, they're in Princeton and um, park and go towards the, the uh, woods on the right-hand side of the street as you head towards Route 1 and go up around the trees and you'll see the emergence holes of the nymphs when they come out of the ground and you'll see where they've climbed up the tree or up on grass and um, emerged out of that nymphal skin. And you should be also able to see the, the newly emerged adults hanging upside down on plant material, waiting for their bodies to harden in their, and then their wings to expand it and whatnot. And it's a fun thing to watch happen. You know, I, tried to, I tried to videotape that and I ran out of, of um, um, I couldn't do it all. It, it takes several hours for them to completely harden. And I'm sorry, I cut somebody off. Yeah, do you know if you get the three different species there of the 17 year? I do not know whether we um, have more than one species in, in this brood in that location. So the best place to figure that out would be with, um, there's a woman up at U UConn. I'm sure she has a, a website. If you type Yukon and periodical cicada, it should come up and, and she has spent her whole career um, tracking where these different broods um, are coming out and whether the, they're the 17 years um, version or the 13 year version and which species um, are in each of those broods in those different locations. In fact, she was down um, the last time they came out with nature at that park in the evening doing taping for a nature show about it and her name is escaping me at the moment another what good they do to come out oh, i'm sorry i was just going to say another good place is in the sourlands i'm about 15 huh. miles from princeton in the oh, okay Mountains. and yep. this will be my third uh experience with this okay the first one was about uh about a year after we moved here and it's it's quite exciting uh, Broad-winged hawks, we have nesting quite near our property in the Sourlands, and they love to eat them. You'll see them on the forest floor, picking them off in the morning as they come up out of the ground. It's pretty amazing. Cool. That's neat. Okay, good. Yeah, um, they're, they're, yeah it's a spectacular thing. This will be my second time. Yeah. And la last time, I took all my grad students, all the department grad students out and said, I know you've never seen this, so and you may not see this again. So let's go take a look. And we're going to go do that again this year, too. Mm -hmm. If they'll allow us to put more than one person in a vehicle to get there so I can take them in our department vans. <laughs> I hope we can do that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm hoping that the Mississippi kites come up and nest here and eat them. <laughs> I had a question about when that is expected to happen. It, sh it should start to happen probably in early June. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I want to say a very big thank you to Dr. Hamilton for joining us tonight. Very illuminating presentation, very timely topic that we all need to be aware of. So thank you so much for joining You're us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. For all our members to come. And I just want to mention our next meeting, which is March 2nd. Mark your calendars. And our presenter is our own Wade Wander. And the topic is Butterflies Lost, Extirpated Butterflies in New Jersey. So it should be another very interesting uh, presentation. In the meantime, um, stay safe and think spring. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone next month. Take care, everybody. Bye. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. So, Jen, stay on for just a second. Okay.